The goal of this video is to introduce you to the notion of the dot product of two vectors in the plane. So the plan is we're going to first define the dot product of two vectors. We're going to look at some simple examples to make sure we know how to calculate them. And then we're going to examine the geometric meaning of the dot product and learn how to use these uh, dot products to find the angle between two given vectors. So the definition is pretty simple. Suppose you have a pair of vectors u and v, and let's suppose we have the components, so the horizontal component of u is a and the vertical component is b, and then we have components p and q for v, and you define the dot product of u and v, we're going to define this quantity to equal ap plus bq. So you take like components, multiply them together, and then add the resulting products. And this is our definition of the dot product. Now, Right off the bat, we have no reason to believe this is even an interesting thing to have in hand, but it is very interesting. So first, let's make sure we know how to calculate this thing. So suppose you have the vector 3, 4, and the vector 5, 2. So the dot product is going to be 3 times 5 plus 4 times 2. Where does that come from? Like components, 3 times 5, 2 times 4, and then you add the result of each of those products, and so you get 23. So this dot product is 23. Let's take the dot product of 4, negative 1, and negative 2, 5. And when all the dust settles, you should, you should see that this dot product is negative 13. So the first dot product is positive. This dot product is negative. And here's an example, negative 1, 2, and 4, 2, where you take the dot product, and you actually get 0. So the dot product can apparently be positive, negative, or 0. All options are on the table. So Here's a fancy statement. The dot product is a scalar-valued binary operation on vectors. That's a mouthful, but what it really just means is you take two vectors and you have this machine which basically um, operates on those components and spits out eventually a number. And that's really the point of this. The dot product takes two vectors as inputs and, and as an output gives you a single real number. And, in fact, because in the context of conversation, when you're having a conversation about vectors, a number is often referred to as a scalar as opposed to a vector. So for this reason, sometimes this product is called the scalar product. That's a synonym you're going to hear sometimes. So scalar product, dot product, and another thing you might hear is the inner product. So these three um, synonyms, all, they're, they're all the same thing. We're talking about the dot product here. So the dot product is commutative. And let's prove that. Suppose you pick any two vectors, u and v, and you calculate the dot product, and you get ap plus bq by definition. That's what the dot product is. But of course, ap is equal to pa, and bq is equal to qb. So that's just a property of real numbers, real numbers under mul usual multiplication. That's commutative. And you should recognize, however, that pa plus qb is exactly what you get if you use the definition of dot product to find v dot u. So u dot v and v dot u are the same. And that's exactly what we mean when we say the dot product is commutative. u dot v equals v dot u. It doesn't matter what order you take the vectors when you operate on them with the dot product. You're going to get the same number. So here's another observation. The dot product of a vector with itself yields the square of the norm of the vector. A mouthful to say, and the idea is probably a lot simpler than that. So here's a vector u with components a, b, and we're going to look at the norm, the length. The norm of u is a squared plus b squared. And if you calculate u dot u, you're just going to get a squared plus b squared, which of course is the square of the norm. And so what we've just learned is u dot u is the, normed, is the norm of u squared. And this gives you the first hint that the dot product is really telling you something about the geometry of, um, of what's going on with the vectors. So let's explore this further. Suppose you have two different vectors, u and v, and our claim is the dot product yields information, geometric information, about the positions of u and v uh, relative to each other. And to prove that, let's suppose this is where the unit circle is in our picture. And these are the respective normalizations of u and v. In other words, they are vectors of unit length pointing in the same direction as u and v. Now, it's important enough, we're going to take a look at this picture. We're going to blow this picture up. Here's u hat and v hat. 
and the tips of these vectors are on the unit circle. So let's suppose this angle's alpha. We could draw the angle in this picture on the left over here. It's the same angle. There's angle alpha. Once we know what that angle is, because we're talking about a point on the unit circle, we actually are able to just say what the coordinates are. They're cosine alpha, sine alpha. And that means the components of our vector are cosine alpha, sine alpha as a vector. And similarly, if this angle's beta, then our components for v hat are cosine beta, sine beta. So let's put these off to the side. We're going to need these. And now let's think about how we're going to recover u from the unit vector u hat. So the unit vector obviously has length 1, and the vector u has, by definition, norm of u for its length. And so how do you recover u from u hat? You simply scale u hat by the length of u. And this looks rather cosmic, but um, it's a useful thing to keep in the back of your mind. u can be recovered as the length of u times the unit vector pointing in the same direction as u. Now, what this means, if you put in the details here, u hat is cosine alpha sine alpha, and if you actually execute the scalar multiplication, here are your components of the vector. And you don't have to be uh, quite as cosmic as this. You can use just good old-fashioned right triangle trigonometry to check your result. If you had a triangle where this angle's alpha and the length is norm of u, good old-fashioned right triangle trigonometry is going to tell you that these lengths are respectively norm u cosine alpha, norm u sine alpha. And so now if you just think of this as a vector, then you see that the components are exactly what we expect them to be. However you want to think about this is fine, but we want to express u as the norm of u times cosine alpha, norm of u sine alpha for the components. And of course, v, it's going to be the same story there. So there's our expression for v. So we've got u and v, and now we're ready to take the dot product. So the dot product is going to look like this, and we're going to calculate that mess and we're going to factor out norm u, norm v. And now you've got this big mess with trig functions. Let's think about what this is. If we define this angle theta, we'll notice that it's beta minus alpha. It's the angle you would add to alpha to get beta. It's beta minus alpha. What happens if you try to take the cosine of theta? Well, it's the cosine of beta minus alpha. And you should remember the angle addition formula. It's actually a difference formula cosine beta cosine alpha plus sine beta sine alpha. That's, that's a result of the angle addition formula for cosine. And now you notice, oh, that expression right there is cosine theta. So the dot product winds up being norm of u, norm of v, cosine theta. And let's clear away the clutter. This is our big punchline. u dot v is the length of u times the length of v times the cosine of the angle in between u and v. A lot of information here, so let's tease out what this really implies. For example, how is it possible for u dot v to be 0? Well, there, there are a couple silly ways it could be 0. If either u or v is the 0 vector, then the length of either one of those vectors is going to be 0, and so u dot v is going to be 0 in that case. So that's a that's an easy case. That's sort of a silly case. Another possibility is that cosine theta equals 0. And this is a little more interesting because if cosine theta is 0, well, we know then that theta has got to be pi over 2 or negative pi over 2. And so what we're talking about in that case is a right angle. In other words, u and v are going to be perpendicular to each other. Now, the converse is also true. If u and v are perpendicular to each other, then the angle between them is going to be plus or minus pi over 2, in which case cosine theta is 0, and then our formula tells us that u dot v has to be 0. So we can clean this all up and give a nice characterization of, of when vectors are perpendicular to each other. If u and v are non-zero vectors, u dot v equals 0 if and only if u and v are perpendicular to each other. Now we can actually riff on this theme and get even more information. Suppose u and v are both non-zero. This quantity right here, well, the norm can't be zero and it can't be negative, so that quantity's got to be positive. And that tells you that the sine of u dot v is completely determined by the 
quantity cosine theta. Cosine theta is going to be positive if and only if u dot v is positive when you've got u and v being non-zero vectors. That's going to mean something. So let's plot cosine theta as a function of theta, familiar cosine curve. We've already seen that the vectors are going to be perpendicular to each other when u dot v is equal to zero. And what we're saying is the angle in between um, the two vectors is pi over 2, or maybe negative pi over 2 if we measure in the other direction. And you can see these values on the cosine graph are zero, and so u dot v is going to be zero. What happens if we have an obtuse angle between the vectors? So theta is going to lie between pi over 2 and pi in this case. And if you look at your graph of cosine, all your values of cosine are negative. That means cosine theta is negative, and that means u dot v is negative. So in the obtuse case, u dot v is negative. What happens in the acute case? Theta has got to be between 0 and pi over 2. Look at the graph of cosine. The values are all positive in this region, and therefore cosine theta is positive, and u dot v is positive. Nice. You just have to look at the dot product of two vectors and, and just analyze whether the quantity is positive, negative, or zero, and you're going to be able to tell whether or not you've got an acute angle, an obtuse angle, or uh, a right angle. Now, if the question didn't cross your mind on the previous slide, it should now. Let's think about this for a second. When you try to decide what the angle is between two vectors, isn't there some sort of ambiguity? I mean, after all, if you measure in the counterclockwise sense, you're measuring positive angles. And if you, if you measure clockwise, you're, you're, you're actually measuring negative angles. So right off the bat, you know that if theta is one way of measuring in the counterclockwise direction, then negative theta is what you get if you go the other way. And so the answer is yes, there must be some sort of ambiguity here. But the good news is it doesn't matter when it comes to this dot product formula. So let's really examine why this is true. I mean, here's theta and here's negative theta, and they both have the same value of cosine because cosine is an even function. So cosine theta is going to be the same whether you measure it clockwise or counterclockwise. But now there are other ways of measuring the angle in between. I mean, I suppose your idea of between could be rather strange. What if you started at the blue vector, went all the way around 2 pi, and then backed up theta, and the net result would be the angle 2 pi minus theta, and that's the same as if you went all the way around counterclockwise from the blue to the gold arrow, that's 2 pi minus theta, and that could be a perfectly, that could be a perfectly legitimate idea uh, in someone's head for what it means to be between the two vectors. But here's the thing, if you plot 2 pi minus theta on your graph, you're going to get the same value of cosine. And similarly, if you went around the other way, theta minus 2 pi, you're going to get the same value. And it's worth thinking about this for a little bit. You should sit down with a graph of cosine and two vectors and imagine all the, all the ways you could measure from one vector to the other. All those ways correspond precisely to the various symmetries of cosine. And you're always going to get the same value of cosine no matter how you measure from one angle to the other. So. Although theta is ambiguous, it turns out cosine theta is not ambiguous. And that's really what's important for this formula. Now, let's return to this special case where u happens to be the same vector as v. Then you'd get this formula right here. And in this case, theta is 0. And when theta equals 0, cosine is 1. And once again, we recover a formula we've already seen earlier. u dot u is the square of the norm of u. So let's find out how to, how to calculate the angle between two vectors. If you divide through by the lengths of u and v, you get this formula right here. Now we're assuming u and v are both non-zero, or the notion of angle between the vectors wouldn't make sense anyway. So both the norm of u and the norm of v are non-zero, and that's not going to be a problem. Let's look at a specific example. Suppose we have the vectors here. Let's give them names. It doesn't matter which order we name them. So let's call them, they're 4, 4, and 3, negative 1. And let's calculate u dot v. u dot v is going to be 8. And the norm can be calculated by taking u dot u and then taking the square root. And of course, the norm of v can be calculated similarly. And what's intriguing about this is you'll notice that everything on the right side of that equation has something to do with the dot product.
So we're going to substitute all this information in, and then you can simplify that a little bit. And cosine theta turns out to be 1 over radical 5. And therefore, theta is arc cosine of 1 over root 5, which turns out to be about 1.107 radians. Or if you measured in degrees, it's about 63.4, which is consistent with the picture. looks about right. And so there's your angle between the two vectors. Now, one last comment. When you use this method, when you find arc cosine of this expression, you're actually picking out one of the ambiguous, infinitely ambiguous ways of measuring the angle in between the two vectors. And let's remember what the arc cosine function looks like. Here's cosine. It's not invertible. If you want to invert it, you got to restrict the domain. And this is the usual way to restrict the domain on the interval from 0 to pi. And the arc cosine function is what you get when you flip that graph across the line y equals x. So here's your graph of the arc cosine function. And you'll notice that the range of that function, the set of outputs, is the interval from 0 to pi. Those are the only angles you can get out. So whenever you calculate the angle between vectors using this method, your output's going to be between 0 and pi. What's the consequence of this? If you really want to get technical about it, you are measuring precisely the counterclockwise smallest angle between the two vectors. So whenever you're looking at a diagram of two vectors and you use this method, you should just realize that you're calculating the smallest angle between the two vectors, and you're really even doing it in the counterclockwise sense.